All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am delighted to be joined by Mark Bandy, who is in lovely Phoenix, Arizona. How are you doing, Mark? John, I'm doing great and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm, as usual, not that far away from Mark here in, in San Diego. And uh, Mark has his own consulting company, Boundary Consulting, but he's also bringing out a new book, which is going to be released on March 13th, which is called Radical Value, Elevate Your Company and Career by Unleashing the Power Within Customer Centricity. Okay, so um, Mark, you know, the premise of your book is, right, the purpose of any company is to generate higher value than it, than it costs to deliver, okay? So let's just baseline it a little bit about what prompted you to write the book and, and, and just expand on the core theme. Well, I really want to change the way a lot of businesses approach their business. Mm -hmm. And I had been for almost a decade a consultant with one of the big sales training companies. Yeah. And what I and every other consultant at this giant company, so this is tens or hundreds of thousands of opportunity reviews. What we all knew that people get wrong is understanding customer perceived value. And I mm -hmm. talked to competing consultants with competing methodologies and it wasn't the methodology's fault because you talk to people from, from Miller Hyman, from target account selling, from challenger, anybody, what people get wrong, what salespeople don't do well enough is customer perceived value. And from my old academic days, I know that customer perceived value is the one thing that changes customers' mind. Value, mm -hmm. perceived value drives decisions. So if that's the thing that salespeople are doing poorly, and it's the thing that moves your sale, maybe I need to help people focus on the right part of what, you know, the, 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 the most important part of selling. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, a lot of, a lot of salespeople would say, oh yeah, yeah, no, I understand it's about the, you know, where the customer sees value and all of that, but they still struggle a lot of the time is actually to uncover what that is. So uncover what the perception, what the perceptions of value are for, for the customer. So what are some of the ways that, says people can start to go about doing that or do that more effectively? Well, it starts with really understanding the customer's world, the customer's business, and understanding what their needs might be, and then having some, some likely hypotheses, some likely search points for understanding where that value might be. I define value as the desirability of customer outcomes. Right? Customers mm -hmm. don't buy your product, they don't buy your service, they buy their own outcomes for their own reasons. And so you have to find out what outcomes they're buying and how bad they want them. Mm -hmm. And the better you understand their business and the better you understand their world, the more you can find out what outcomes they're looking for. And I think that's a, and I think that's a critical point here just to emphasize is, uh, I'm not saying that you ever could get away with it, but certainly today, I think if you're going to be successful, you have to uh, understand the business of business and you have to understand the business of your customer or who you're targeting. You can't get away anymore with a very superficial level of knowledge. You really have to have that kind of business acumen and that and that um, curiosity to understand what's happening in that business, in that segment, in the market that you're operating in, right? Boy, John, you, you couldn't have said it better. You know, I had been lucky to work in a bunch of different industries where mm. my customer, each new customer was in a different industry. If you're in commercial banking, sure. you're not always selling to the same kind of industry. You're selling to a new industry every time. Yeah. And you have to develop a skill set of coming up to speed in a new industry that you've never worked in every single time. So I took some, some of part of what I do is taking though that skill set and turning it into a tool set so that people can come up to speed quickly on a stranger's business. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're absolutely right that you can't know thy customer's business until you know business. And um, it is so important. You know, research has found that customers no longer trust salespeople as an information source. 
Sure. And but they want to, especially when a decision is risky, when it's new, when it's unfamiliar, they want to find a resource and they're more than willing to have that salesperson be that. But there's always that expectation that every salesperson I've ever talked to has been just a gopher for getting me the information that I know I want, not somebody who provides me insight or, or provides me new ways of looking at my problems. And so the demand that salespeople have is to overcompensate. You've got to be way, way better than mm. the customer's expectation to start being that valued resource to be brought in when they're trying to figure out and develop their decision criteria. Yeah, and obviously to do that, right, Mark, is you have to be able to have really good conversations, right? And you have to have a conversation that draws the other person into to expanding a little bit more on what's going on with their organization and what's important to the organization and what's important to them as well. Uh, so how, how, can, how can salespeople uh, improve the level of the kind of engagements or communication that they have with, when they get a prospect? Well, I hate to sound too woo-woo here, John, but it has to start with the intentionality and the mindset that mm -hmm. I'm not here to sell crap. I'm here to help a customer make a better decision than any other salesperson is going to help them make. Mm -hmm. And that means genuine curiosity, genuine empathy for your customer. And once you do that and you have some real deep understanding of your customer's world and their business, it becomes easier to ask questions. Now, I also have tools to, to help understand all the different hypotheses to develop a complete set of possible areas that a salesperson should be exploring with a given customer um, rather than a single threaded value proposition, which is I, I'm on a campaign this week to <laughs> say, I hate the word value proposition because so many times that means it's a single threaded, most likely hypothesis. And the yeah. world has gotten too complex and too multifaceted for you to use that one size fits all value yeah. hypothesis. So I want to develop a myriad of hypotheses and let a salesperson with some deep customer insight pick from a menu that he thinks he or she thinks is going to be a great conversation. And that's a real great way to differentiate yourself as a seller. Yeah, and I see in, in, in chapter five of your book that's coming out, you, you have a, a lot of great information around understanding the customer's business environment. And I think this is where a lot of people struggle because they don't, they don't look at a, a customer's business environment, look at, okay, there are, you have like external forces, internal, for, internal forces at work. So they don't look at it holistically. They tend just to focus in on maybe just trying to find a singular pain point or two. Yeah. I think you hear some simplistic folks in the world saying, um, my training is going to help you either help them save money or save time, because those are the mm -hmm. important things. And if you can't do that, um, you shouldn't be selling. And those two are important, but there's so many other things that you can do. You can help them reduce risk. You can help them. Uh, there's dozens of different things you can do. And if you are only selling time savings or money savings, you're selling the exact same thing that your three largest competitors are selling and you aren't differentiating. You're, mm -hmm. you're in the top group, but you are only in the top group. Yeah. And I think one of the things, uh, Mark, as we know, is uh, that often happens is that uh, says people will latch on to the first thing that you mention as a prospect that maybe is an issue that you're trying to solve. But they don't develop it enough to see whether that's actually an issue that you're you're going to solve, right? It may be something that's an irritant right now, but you, you know, maybe you're going to live with it, but you have to go a little deeper and really understand what are the ramifications of everything and are there enough and who else is involved. And I guess the other piece that I often find people leave out is the benefit to the organization, right? Yeah. But what about to the person they're talking to? What about the different individuals? What's, what's in it for them? What's riding on it for them? Because at the end of the day, it's human beings buying, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Value is this multifaceted thing. It's not a single thing. It's what does the customer already know about in terms of their trouble? 
in mm -hmm. both negative and positive, right? Pain and gain that they know about. What are pains and gains that they don't know about that you could open their eyes to? And which ones, and for each of those things, there's some business or corporate solutions that you can give. And what does that mean to them personally? Uh, some of my best, most epic sales stories uh, came about because I help people solve personal problems. Mm. Um, I had priced something at the, I had, I had pricing discretion and I had priced it right at the pain threshold because I knew from a business standpoint, what I was getting was unique. And so here's the price that it is worth mm -hmm. to the customer. And I was taking every penny of that value to them in terms of price. And they're going back and forth until I saved the owner of the business, $80,000 in estate planning that right. wasn't going to go at all to the business who was actually signing the deal, but I was saving a, a person, something personal. And it was all because I found out about his relationship with his kids, his 40 year old mm -hmm. kids. And it was, um, it, we, and that's not, that shouldn't have to be a one-off. Oh, that's the greatest thing I ever did in my sales mm -hmm. career. That should be something you learn how to do as a standard practice. And as a repeatable way of thinking that you're looking for that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I think what, uh, and I think what underlying all of this, Mark, is the very idea is that, as we said, is that value is multifaceted and you have to understand all the different components of it and that value is created in, in different ways, in different places for different people. So it's not, as you said, you can't take a, a singular, a singular approach to this. Um, but I also feel like today it's, um, a lot of salespeople are, are, are daunted because, you know, there's more people than ever involved in buying decisions. You know, there's all that information out there on the internet there. There's more, probably more competitors than ever. There's a perception of commoditization on behalf of most customers. So it seems like a daunting task for salespeople. So how would you, how would you advise somebody if they wanted to sort of take a look at how they're selling today, a couple of things where they could maybe take some inventory in it and figure out, are they doing it in the best way they could possibly do it? Um, your basic sales methodology shows you how to manage the complexity of mm -hmm. all those multiple peoples. The average, what is the average now? 6.8. Yeah, like and that. it's, it's important to be able to manage the complexity that you know about, but I think it's also great sellers understand that is the value and those 6.8 people are the ones the customer knew to direct me to. And right. if I understand my value, I should be adding it to uh, and taking that 6.8 to about eight or nine, because there's three people that I and my differentiated offer is going to find value for. And I'm going to have to increase the size of the buying group to my benefit because there's three additional people who really want what I can offer. And again, that goes back to business acumen, understanding your solution, understanding mm -hmm. the outcomes. Um, but you can sit back and passively try to manage the complexity that your customer gives you, or you can lean into the customer's value and try to differentiate yourself and offer value to the customer the way they should be buying. And that takes some courage. Take some mm -hmm. bedside manner to get the leader of the decision group to add a new person to the team because socially it's hard to do that. And so it takes some um, bedside manner to be able to mm -hmm. get, uh, get that team to add a new person or two or three to the team. But it's going to make you a lot more successful if you're able to foresee the additional complexity that's needed and introduce that. Yeah, and uh, and uh, another thing that's underpinning um, your book and you know radical value is the idea of leveraging tools and and I think this is one of the things that I know from your background with Miller Hyman and you know back when I was uh, 
you know, looking after health weight and that is you can, you can teach people like call planning and you can teach people, um, you know, uh, call reviews and all of this kind of stuff. But until they, uh, until they really integrate these things into their work practice and they become part of how they operate, uh, they, then otherwise they're just kind of doing stuff and 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 not not lever- you're not systematizing what they're doing and I guess that's the thing is I mean if you want to be successful especially in a complex environment you have to kind of systematize your approach right and you have to be disciplined about that oh you absolutely do and there's a lot of moving parts and but here's the challenge is that when you develop that system you know that I actually I did the arithmetic with a Miller Hyman methodology. Mm-hmm. And 10% of this particular methodology, 10% of the, you know, the the famous sheets, right? The blue sheet, Mm -hmm. sheet, 10% of the sheet was devoted to customer percent, customer perceived value. 10% of the training time, customer perceived value. 10% of the coaching class, customer perceived value. But that's 90% of what's important. So when we systematize, how surprised are we that the salespeople only give 10% of their effort to understand customer perceived right. value when that's how we guided them. So um, we have to understand as leaders that systematizing, I, I'm a huge believer in the Miller-Hyman methodology. Mm. I, I'm beyond drank the Kool-Aid, I'm marinated in it. <laughs> um, but I also don't want to fool any salespeople to think that every single bit of it is as perform- as important in your sale. Sure. And uh, I worked with a company once upon a time that was maniacal about understanding the customer perceived value. And it wasn't only understanding the customer outcome, but taking that all the way out to how many dollars of price premium can we get from each individual value driver. So that we knew, and so I, that was you know, the story I told you about this. I had priced my offer at exactly the amount that captured every penny right. of price, available price premium, but it's because I had learned how to quantify the achievable price premium. Um, and when you can, when the sales coach could understand, could ask what's the value, and you as a salesperson could answer that clearly, I knew that you had done the entire methodology really well. And if you couldn't, now let's back up and find out which part of the system you, you, you weren't practicing. But there's a, the final exam question is, what's the value? And if you can answer that, that question correctly as a salesperson, you've done everything else right. And mm-hmm. if you can't, now let's, let's diagnose what's going on. And of course, uh, underpinning all of this is that you have to have your sales leaders, your managers, and that coaching and guiding to these principles. As a, because let's face it, at the end of the day, most salespeople will take their cues from their manager, right? What's important oh. to their manager is going to be important to them. What doesn't seem important to their manager is going to be kicked to the side, walk as you know, quickly as possible. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, it, it's one thing to teach them, and another thing to coach them. Uh, yet a third thing to put that in the incentive. I talked to um, um, Jim Dickey, and he, <clears throat> you know, he he no longer owns CSO Insights and hasn't researched this in a few years. Um, but at the time, he sold it for ten years. It was very stable. That only twenty five percent of all sales forces had any component of their comp plan in deal profitability. Yeah. So if 75% of the sales forces in the world are the only department in their entire company that doesn't care about profit, what does that say? And, and quite frankly, how well viewed is that sales leader who only cares about unprofitable you know, revenue, whether it's profitable or not, how much of a seat at the executive table does that sales leader have? Yeah, because it is an it is an interesting phenomenon about the fact that, uh, and even and even I've found in the past, even when some people do kind of profitability models for revenue for for deals, they still omit a lot of cost. You know, it's the hidden cost. It's that it's that where you've pulled in resources from here or there to help you, but you don't really calculate in the opportunity cost of what they could be doing or their time and all of that. And, and yeah, I think, I think because I mean, unfortunately we live in this world where everything is about top line growth and 
that's the mantra that's being you know spewed out by everybody and that whole idea of profitability and and understanding the profitability of 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 a piece of business it seems so like old fashioned but at the end of the day that's really what counts yeah there's a, an old quote by a fellow named John Abbott and he said a business without profit is no more a business than a pickle is candy <laughs> yeah exactly and so if, if you sell if you sell enough at unprofitable i mean jeff bezos did it for 20 straight yeah. years for 80 straight mm-hmm. quarters but nobody else has managed anything yeah. remotely close to that and exactly. you're either going to be jeff bezos or you're going to have to sell profitably soon <laughs> yeah and there's only one jeff bezos well so, um listen mark as we come to the end of our time here well i hope just i hope everybody has seen as if this is actually being recorded on valentine's day i hope nobody gets pickles instead of candy today but, uh, <laughs> whatever you're into <laughs> um, um mark before we go do you want to tell people a little bit more about your book it's coming out on on march 13th yeah the, the book is going to be available on amazon look for Radical Value, and it's going to be on Amazon uh, on March 13th is the launch date. Go on it, sneak on Amazon and look for it on the 12th because for 24 hours, I'm going to have a pre-launch discount. And here I am, Mr. Value Discount. But Mm -hmm. uh, it's all about uh, getting the number of book copies sold and it's valuable to me to give up some price in order to move up a bestseller list. So don't mistake my discounting to you as something where I am not getting some value in return. <laughs> Excellent. Listen, Mark, this has been great. And by the way, Mark is a regular contributor to sales pop. Uh, he regularly, uh, sends in posts, great blog posts. I really encourage you to read them and uh, you know subscribe to him on Sales Pop. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeline and CRM. Listen, Mark, a pleasure as always. And I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. John, thank you so much. I appreciate you having me on.